A warm well, welcome to today's talk, Tuesday the 10th of May. Now I want to focus mostly on the United States today, what's going on there and what about this talk of 100 million cases in autumn, is this credible? Um, it, it is credible, is to give you the bottom line of the video, but it probably won't be as harmful as some of the American authorities appear to be indicating. But before we get there, let's just look at some comparative data from the United Kingdom. Now, here we have the new daily confirmed cases, and this is basically in the Omicron wave. So this is BA1 here. So we see the United States in red, uh, in dark red, in the United Kingdom in light red. So the United Kingdom BA1 wave happened first, followed by the United States. And then what we noticed was that the BA2 wave started in the UK here. And I had been predicting that the United States wave would follow with a similar kind of gap between there and there, expecting that between there and there. But we're really quite pleased to say that this has not happened. So very happy to be, to be wrong on that. The BA2 bounce in the States has not really happened. Now, of course, these are cases, not infections. We know that cases are a subset of infections. So it's probably better to look at hospitalizations to give more accurate data. And here we see the number of COVID patients in hospital. So again, the United States in dark red, the United Kingdom in light red. And again, we saw the BA1 increase in hospitalizations in the UK here. And likewise in the United States, only more so. And then we saw a BA2 increase in hospitalizations in the UK, but not in the United States. Now we are seeing a slight increase now. And this is due to BA2 in the States and its subvariants, such as BA2 12.1 uh, so we are we are seeing that but we haven't seen the surge that we anticipated uh, or i anticipated which of course is is remarkably good news because we're not seeing the increase in hospitalizations in the states and the reason for this seems to be the large amount of immunity that was already there in the states from large amounts of vaccination partly but also from large amounts of um, previous infection of course now, moving on to the main topic that we want to talk about today, United States deaths are going to reach 1 million this week. Now, this is the current figure from the uh, Centers for Disease Control, so about 5,000 to go. But we know because of the delay in data that the 1 million deaths um, attributable to uh, COVID-19 have already occurred in the United States. And we know that the excess death figure is even sadly higher than that number. Now, I wanted to compare this to 1918-1919, that terrible pandemic. That killed at least, uh, this was influenza, of course, this was H1N1 uh, uh, type, uh, type influenza virus. At least 50 million people died worldwide. 675,000 died in the United States, but the population at the time of the United States was only 105 million. So we can see the per capita death rate um, was much higher in 1918-19 compared to the pandemic of uh, 2019, 2020, 2021 and 2022. Uh, mortality in 1918-19 was highest in young children under, the, under 5, 20 to 40 year olds and 65 year olds. So if we imagine a graph... Uh, of the 1918 pandemic and that that's uh, that's increasing deaths there on on the uh, up and down scale and, and that's the age there then deaths were high in uh, in in young children went down then they were higher again in in middle-aged people and uh high yet in older people so this is sometimes described as a sort of w-shaped uh, death pattern so an awful lot of deaths in in young children under the age of five a lot of deaths in the 20 to 40 year old age, age, 20 to 40 age group, and as you would expect in the over 65s. And of course, this is in stark contrast to the current pandemic. So um, it lets us realise just how terrible it must have been in the 1918-19 pandemic that so many children and young fit adults, there wasn't comorbidities here, these were young fit adults were dying. So it's not as bad as then, but it's what we've got now. Now, National Centres for Health say it's more than one million of uh, statistics, more than one million deaths already, of course. A higher death rate than any other major industrialised country. 
So there's no two ways about it. The United States has not done well in this pandemic. Why are the death rates in the United States so high? Now, of course, we could talk about many reasons for this. Um, and I'm not going to go through them now because we have talked about them before. But, but it's, it's an interesting cause for reflection. Just why have the deaths in the United States been higher than other industrialized countries of course it's an older demographic we know there's sometimes difficulty accessing health care we know there's reluctance to take up vaccine in certain age groups we know that there wasn't initial lockdown measures but there again um, the death rates have been high all the way through so it really is quite hard to explain but the facts are it's still the highest uh, of any industrialized country do, do, do let me know what ideas you've got there um, I should have prepared a better list than that, but that's what we've got at the moment. <laughs> anyway, life expectancy is the biggest drop since 1918-1919. And this, this, of course, was the double whammy of the pandemic and the First World War. So it's the biggest drop in life expectancy in over 100 years in the States. Most deaths were in the unvaccinated, and there was more deaths in low-income people, black and Hispanic populations and we've looked at various theories as to why that might be. Now in 2020 the leading cause of death in the United States was heart disease, the second leading cause was cancer and the third leading cause was it was COVID, that was the data from 2020. Now um, this, this is tracking the uh, reach of COVID-19 in kin, so this is how it affect, affected people who were uh, um, the relative, the relatives of those of those that died. <clears throat> so th this is from Penn State, and I think it was Southern California as well. They did this estimate way back in 2020, but it still stands. What what, what they worked out was that for every one person that died, uh, nine other people were directly uh, affected in terms of um, basically first order relatives. So um, so that means 9 million have lost a close relative so far in the States. And close relative here is defined as a grandparent, a parent, a sibling, a spouse, or uh, in some cases, tragically, uh, a child. So uh, basically 9 million people grieving in the States over death of a, of a close relative. Now just look, let's look, just look at the, uh, the current figures in the States here a minute. So here we see the overall diagnosed uh, cases in the States over time. Very high Omicron numbers of diagnosed infections. And of course, that is a subset of the actual number of infections. Then looking at that in a little more close up, we can see there's a slight increase at the moment due to the Omicron BA2. But nothing like as high as we've had in the United Kingdom and, and in other places in Europe. Here's the hospitalisation overall figure. We do see that it's up over the past seven days. So that was the seven days prior. That's the last seven days up to which there's data. But that's only up to the end of April. So I'm afraid we will see that slightly increased when we get the newer uh, data. And uh, this is the uh, trend in deaths in the United States. Thankfully, fairly flat now. Um, and we hope it stays fairly flat. Now let's um, go on and look at um, cases and infections in the States. Now they're probably going to start going down from late May in terms of infections. As the weather gets better through the north of the United States, um, the cases are probably going to go down. And the other reason I'm saying this is because that's what's happened in Europe. The cases are going down quite dramatically. The infections are going down. And of course, even in, in the UK, there's actually 10 times more infections than cases. We're only picking up about 10% of them at the moment due to the uh, basically having to pay for testing and other testing uh, issues. So um, United States should start to go down from late May. Um, another prediction I'm making here is BA2 12.1 is set to take over from BA2 in, and is already doing so. But cases may increase in the south over summer. Now, the reason I'm saying this is this is what's happened over the last two summers. There's been some increase in cases in the southern United States, some increase in infections in the southern United States over summer. And I believe the reason for this is people are inside a lot of the time in aircon sharing each other's air because it's simply too hot outside. 
I think the reason is that simple. Now, the Biden administration press conference uh, warning 100 million infections in fall and winter of 2022. Is this, is this uh, credible? Well, the reason that they're saying this is partly, of course, to, to get more funding. They, 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 want, they want more funds to be released, but it, it is credible. But I'm optimistic that because of the immunity and the reduced uh, virulence, the reduced pathogenicity of the BA2 subvariant compared to the BA1 and the Omicron, less severe than the Delta, that for most people, this is going to be a very mild experience for the vast majority of people. So I'm much less worried about it, although the actual number of infections could be very high. How many of those are picked up and converted into cases, of course, will depend on the testing. Now, there's waning immunity vaccines uh, and, uh, and infections. So waning immunity from uh, vaccines, yes. Is there waning immunity from previous infections? Well, there will be some, but unfortunately we're not told. Um, I would have thought that the immunity from vaccines is going to wane quicker than the immunity from infections, but that data is not really closely spelled out. Variant immune escape. Well, we, we know that Omicron infections, are, there's 10 times the reinfection rate with Omicron compared to Delta. Is this going to be the case for future variants which might pop up? Well, of course, we, uh, we, we don't know yet. Loosened restrictions in the States, of course, allows for more spreading. Uh, but these projections assume Omicron subvariants will continue to dominate community spread. I think that is a fair, a fair assessment because it's unlikely we're going to get a non-Omicron variant that outcompetes Omicron in terms of infectivity. It's possible, but it's more likely that we're going to get these Omicron subvariants that are more and more infectious and transmissible, which so far have become less and less pathogenic which is another reason for me being fairly optimistic. No dramatically different uh, strains of the virus. We're not expecting that, but that projection is based on that. Now, um, zero prevalence in the United States. Um, again, this is really quite out of date, but this is based on a convenient sampling of blood specimens for the uh, for the anti N antibodies now now these are the nucleo nucleocapsid antibodies now if we remind ourselves of the virus of course we, these are these are internal uh, proteins here so this is the nucleo uh, capsid um, roundabout here it's, it's labelled there in fact it's hold kind of it's associated with the RNA in the middle of the virus and of course if someone gets the infection they've got the whole virus in their body so they're going to, going to make antibodies to everything or the vast majority of these are going to make antibodies too, including those. So this means this is a measure of people that have had infection as opposed to the spike protein antibodies, which are only going to indicate uh, immunity from uh, vaccines. Of course, people that have natural immunity will get spike protein, anti protein antibodies, but it doesn't differentiate. It's the nucleocapsid ones that differentiate. So it's good to see that that's being done. Um, don't know of any similar study in the United Kingdom, which really is quite bizarre, really quite bizarre that that's not being done. Now, um, that's as of February 22, now this is, this is the CDC data, it's so out of date, but um, 18 to 49 year olds, 63.7% had had natural infection. New, new kilo uh, plasmid antibodies were present. Uh, 50 to 64, it was lower, and in the older age group it was much lower, largely because this age group is socialising. Uh, less children and adolescents um it was 75 percent. now in the states this low level of uh, natural infection in the older age groups is a concern because it means a smaller number of the older age group don't enjoy the immunity that they get from natural uh, infection it's a smaller a smaller proportion unfortunately um 75 percent had serological evidence of previous infection in children and adolescents so higher in children and adolescents a higher rate for omicron especially amongst children th th this this um, zero positivity rate for the anti n uh, antibodies has increased quite dramatically during omicron of course now the cdc say that this should not be uh, interpreted as protection as against future infection that's what they're saying, but I would have thought that natural infection would generate at least some protection against future infection because people are making antibodies to all components of the virus. 
So they'll be able to mount a, be able to mount a polyclonal attack on any new viral infection. So, um, but the CDC seems to be going down a bit on natural immunity there. Um, not quite sure why that would be, unless they just want to promote vaccination. Whereas ideally we would have immunity from both, of course. Uh, and they oh, oh, there, well, there's the answer actually. Vax, vaccination remains the safest strategy preventing complications from SARS coronavirus 2 infection. Uh, direct quote. So, CDC seems to be somewhat. Is this just me being cynical or a CDC poo pooing uh, natural infections and promoting vaccine? When I'm quite happy to have uh, immunity from both. Now, that relatively low figure there was back in February, relatively low figures of people say 63.7% of 18 to 49 year olds. Uh, but more up to date data is coming from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Uh, this is from the 7th of April, data goes up to the 4th of April, so much more up to date. And here the, 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 the figure is 76% of people have got, uh, have, people have had the infection as of the 4th of April. And this is from antibody studies. Now, in the UK, we don't know this. Now, the latest data we looked at from the UK, which was an antigen survey carried out with the Office for National Statistics, indicated it was about 71% in England, at least. Why aren't we doing national screening for uh, N antibodies uh, in the UK is, is a bit strange. But we don't seem to be doing that. Um, but fortunately, we do have this ONS study, which tells us that the, it's recording the cumulative number of people that have had the antibodies, and that's about 71%. So it, f from that rather crude estimate, it's slightly comparing apples and oranges, but it's not really. We've got similar levels of natural infection in the UK and the United States. Uh, do not suggest a substantial BA2 surge in the United States, so the correct. Uh, that didn't seem to be happening. That's good. But if they do, it's only going to last for about three weeks. So any increase that we get in the state should be short lived. And they're saying this because that was the situation in Europe. Relatively short lived BA2 bounce. Direct quote from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. There is not sufficient evidence at this time that a BA2 spread warrants a broader push on a fourth booster, except in those at high risk. So good to see that Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, although they're not saying so overtly, do appear to like the idea of the natural immunity of the 76%. And they don't see a need for a fourth dose at the moment. But just in case you were worried about it, Pfizer and Moderna are working on new booster shots, uh, combining uh, different variants of the virus to give a sort of polyclonal vaccine. And hopefully uh, Pfizer and Moderna, uh, or at least hopefully in their terms, they'll carry on making huge amounts of money from selling uh, vaccines. Let's hope there's an objective determination uh, as to whether this will be required or not. Um, and I'm not too sure the CDC is being that objective at the moment but i'll let you decide that all the references are there don't take my word for it go and check it out see if my interpretations are correct and uh, and thank you for watching